This Week in Startups is brought to you by Envision. Find out why so many hot startups are using Envision to prototype, present, and collaborate on design in real time. Sign up for a 90-day free trial today at envisionapp.com slash twist. And PagerDuty, serving as the hub of your operations, aggregating all of your infrastructure monitoring tools and alerting the right people and teams at the right time. Sign up today at pagerduty.com slash twist and get a free t-shirt when you get your first alert. Today's Jason's News Roundtable with Quentin Hardy of the New York Times and Jeff Brokovici of Inc. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals. Until we get the money, spend the money in the future. Hey, everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. We're going to get off with a bang, Theranos, and a hundred billion dollars in market movement as we speak here on a Thursday. What an all star panel we have. Quentin Hardy is here from the New York Times, he's the deputy tech editor and a visiting lecturer at Berkeley's Information School. Jeff Berkovici. Berkovici. You got it. I got it? You got it. Ah, oh, Jeff Brokovici is here. I feel so great. He is the San Francisco chief of Inc. and previously was at Forbes. And um, yeah, He carried the publication. He did oh, fantastic work there. Single-handedly. Well, this is great because I have serious journalists here. And, Quentin, uh, it is an, a monumental day because it is stock day. Everybody's reporting earnings. And you have just uh, told me an incredible in this case, statistic. You know, they say money is information, but in this case, money and stock are total information. Okay, Amazon and Google and Microsoft all reported earnings at about 1 o'clock California time. By 2 o'clock California time, the net market cap of those three was up over $100 billion. $100 billion. $100 billion. Just to give you some sense of how to get your head around that, Last week, Dell bought EMC and VMware. It was the biggest deal in the history of tech. That was what? 50? $67 billion. Okay. So this is 50% more than that in one hour. Right. So what's the information? Well, I sort of dug into the numbers, which is why I was a little late getting here. Sorry about that. Don't worry about and, it. And, uh, you know, Windows 3, Office 365, a cloud application at Microsoft. It's been around for five years. It has 18 million users. Three million of them showed up in the last three months. Wow. Like fully a sixth of them just came, just showed up in the last three months. Amazon, the net, uh, the operating income was more from AWS, the cloud business, yeah. than it was from all of the retail. Incredible. And the growth rate was 178% more than it is in the retail side. Incredible. So like, very quickly, this is going to become a cloud company that has a retail business and not the other way around. Which is amazing. When you think about what Jeff did with the cloud, everybody thought, oh my God, the guy selling books is going to release a cloud platform. And his initial concept was, well, we had to build this for ourselves. We might as well make it available to other people and defer the cost. If you take it apart, he got lucky. He was smart a little of both, but he had paid attention to the signal and just hit it. And for right. years, they couldn't believe nobody else wasn't seeing this. Right. You know, like nobody was moving. Google could have moved on them faster than they did. Yeah, and Google, Google Compute Engine is Well, Compute Engine is not doing too bad, you know. Yeah. And uh, during the call at Google, they were really fronting their cloud storage business. Mm. So they're coming up fast. They know what time it is. Microsoft, I mean, it was so much more impressive than what they're doing off Windows OS at this point. Yeah. So that's kind of my conclusion. You've got, you know, Oracle's going to have its big annual festival for 30,000 people here. HP is going to split into two companies week after next. IBM just announced earnings and fell 5%. You know, these giants, like mm. unthinkably large companies a few years ago, where are they now compared to that It's a little bit of a changing movement? of the guard. But oh. IBM has a huge cloud business now that's getting pretty big. They're nice guys, and I wish yeah. them well. Yeah. They're up, I mean, it's a serious competition right now. Um, um, they're going to spend a ton of money. Yeah. But, you know, they're looking at consultants where the margins are coming down. Right. And Bezos lives in a world of, like, zero margins. Right. So who do you want to be in that competition? Yeah, it's hard. It's um, tough. Okay. So, Jeff, what are your thoughts? I mean, we're, is this as big a deal as Quentin is making it out to be $100 billion in market cap in a day? 
Uh, and the cloud movement, you buy it, of course. Yep. Sure. I mean, Quentin's yeah. the, the, uh, the, the cloud expert in the room, but, uh, you know, I guess there's got to be something cyclical happening there. I mean, Google, I mean, part of that, you know, Google's been down for a couple of, uh, for, for a little bit now for, I mean, I know there were- The revenue days. numbers on Google are all about the advertising and that's a recovery, but yeah. they can build out into this. And by the way, it was the last day as Google, it's Alphabet reporting. Today now. they report as Alphabet, yeah. yeah. And they called and the businesses- like other businesses or oh, and they experiments played, they or something. They played another one of those weird numbers games they like where they They're use doing a the, buyback of whatever, $5 billion <laughs> They're spending $5 buyback. billion. Dollars there. It turns out to be like a square of 20, a square root of 26, which is the number of letters in the alphabet. It's great that people can make jokes with $5 billion. billion. Dollars. Yeah, right. Let's, I know what it'd be fun. Uh, but, you know, there's no question everybody sees this as the growth. Yeah. And the big guys have a ton of cash and not a lot of relevance, and they're going to do a lot of M and A. Yeah. And the issue is, can you buy, build, contract, acquire, partner something to catch up with Microsoft and Amazon, who really own the world right now? Yeah. Yes. I mean, the really interesting. I think I find about Microsoft is I find myself using Outlook again on my phone, and it is delightful on my iPad and my phone. The best email client is. Uh, Outlook, I believe. Yeah. Um, it's the fastest. It's most responsive. It's better than Gmail, and it's better than the Apple native mail client. And then I use Sunrise, which they bought, and people are starting to use Word again. And I, I have Word, and it's free. And I started using it on my iPad. I was like, wow, I forgot. I, I found it very pleasurable to write in Microsoft Word, and I like it again. I wouldn't be terribly surprised if five years from now, they're basically giving away the operating system in order to have people interacting with the applications. And paying, what does Office cost a month now? It's a monthly subscription. It's like five or 10 bucks or something. Yeah, it's cheap. It's cheap. It used to be a $400, three or $400 box you bought. One time buy, but every cloud businesses are annuity businesses. Five yeah. bucks a month, who misses that? That's $60 a year and you're kind of hooked and you buy the other thing. It's like a Netflix subscription. You end up spending a bit of money actually. That's what I'm starting to see. Does either of you think that uh, Slack is a real threat to to Microsoft? I know they're saying the new uh, the new Office is a Slack killer. Oh. Did they include chat in it? Is that the thing? The new Office has some sort of chat in it. Yeah, it's this and that. Here's I, the I, thing. I you know had David Sachs from Yammer, which was the previous version of Slack, right? right. Um, and he was at the scale conference this week, and I interviewed him. And if you look at the SaaS, SaaS growth, um, he was like maybe one of the third all-time growing SaaS companies in terms of hitting a million dollars a month in reoccurring revenue. And Slack's was like, wow, they did it in half the amount of time, just getting to that one million in monthly recurring revenue. And that's obviously because mobile. Mobile didn't exist when Yammer came out. It was a desktop product. And now you have this uh, Slack as a mobile product. And they're, they have consumer-level growth with enterprise level revenue. It's really the first time that's happened. So I actually believe Slack's the real deal. And the and I'm not an investor and I wish I was. The other thing that's very interesting about Slack is, um, which people don't know, is the integrations. So this is where the API is really starting to have an impact on business and on revenue. If you go into the Slack integrations list, probably like half the reason people use Slack is to talk to their mates and their and their and their, you know, different uh, groups and whatever and chat and sort of takes a lot of people off of email and puts them into another different inbox. The other half is people injecting stuff into the Slack chat room. So Zendesk, if you're getting in a bunch of reports, you can keep your one Slack room open and then ding, oh, in the customer support, there's things coming into customer support. Everybody in the organization can go click and go look at the customer support without logging into Zendesk. And your Dropbox and everything else can just, boom, integrate, integrate. And as that list of integrations grows, it's much harder for somebody to then compete with them. We've become the P word. What's you're that? A bit of a platform, aren't you? Exactly. You're the thing other things refer to. Yes. And your hooks get in there, and it's just really hard to move you out. Now, Slack is a mystery to me, though, because I love Slack. Everybody loves Slack. Slack's a beautiful thing. Slack is IRC. Slack has been around for a long time. What yeah. is it about Slack that works so well? This is what I've been trying to figure out. It's easy to get up and running. It's easy to create groups and manage a team. That's really what it is. IRC was hard. And so IRC, it's you know. It's sort of design stuff. It's designed much but better. That and mobile. The fact that it's an app as opposed to like a desktop thing or a web-based client. If you put 
you know, 100 people and say, go install this IRC and get in the IRC chat room, the 20 developers in your organization would make it in in five minutes and maybe 10 other people in your organization would make it in. Right. If you put send 100 people an email invite to Slack, 98 are going to get in. See, I think this is... It's the, just easier. This is such a critical des uh, design point about tech now, yeah. which is make a product that welcomes you. You know, a right. Tesla... The door handles come out towards you when you step up to it. Yep. An iPhone, it comes out of the box charged. You don't charge it and wait. Like little things. These things basically say, "Hi, come on in. Start learning me." Yeah. And no hurdles. You do not read a manual. Ever. No roadblocks. Yeah. Well, that's the consumerization uh, piece of it. But I, I mean, I think everyone designing enterprise software now—well, probably not everyone, but but the smart ones at least—all know that that they have to be, you know, they have to be like Apple, Apple-like, friendly out of the box. But I, uh, that, I don't think that's what, what don't you get about Slack, Slack, though? Slack. I'm wondering. What well, don't you get? My, my main question is whether we all love it right now because it's new, because it's, it's you know, they say Slack is not, is not an inbox. I mean, it's not an inbox. It's, right. it's different. You know, channels are different from, from threads. But I think part of the reason we all love Slack is because it's right now, for so many of us, it's like it's, it's manageable. You know, right. we have, I mean, at Slack, they have had to... Uh, Stuart Butterfield told me that like every time the size of their organization doubles, which has happened probably twenty times in the last oh, year, yeah. they have to have all have a come to Jesus meeting and figure out a new way to use Slack and change up everything. Right. You know, the rest of us, I mean, that's their the job. rules of engagement. Yeah. The rest of us are not going to use it that deliberately. And yeah. I'm just wondering whether the organizations to whom Slack is such a breath of fresh air right now in a year or two are going to say, Oh, Slack will it is become so a chore What's to manage fix your our Slack? Slack? Yeah. Right. They will. They will, and then they'll figure it out. That's one of the nice things about bottom-up IT, which is the other big trend, which is organizations like start using this, and then the IT department finds out about it, and they're like, oh, you're using it? We don't have to buy something, put it on, and become shelfware, which we all knew in the last couple of cycles. You know, some IT department, some CTO or VP of information technology would select Lotus Notes or whatever it was, I'm not saying about Lotus Notes, and then push it on the organization, and everybody would feel like we have to learn this or product, and it would never get used. If people from the bottom up decide to use it, it's so nice for the IT department and the CEO and everybody because it's like, oh, you chose this, you're using it, you're productive at work, great. Oh, it costs $6 a person, $5 a person, who cares? Hmm. It's like, you know, if everybody's getting paid $30, $40, $50 an hour in an organization, it's, is it in the New York Times, Slack? Yes. How has it changed the New York Times, I wonder? If um, at all? There's, an, you know, we have an open plan newsroom, right. but we do have a certain level of siloed desking because mm -hmm you have domain experts in certain areas and they're filing their own deadline. And so it's helped break that down a little bit. And people do see into each other's stuff and cooperate a little bit uh, more easily. So you could jump into arts and leisure or style and just go right into their chat room without yeah, asking? Yeah, but you know, Slack welcomes, but yeah. <laughs> you, I would have to have somebody to contribute to do right. that. But you could just lurk and be like, oh, wow, the style section is talking about interesting stuff. Cool. Never done it, but I suppose so. It's That's what I would want to do. I would go to really stuff. Easily. What order did you read your Sunday New York Times? Give me your first three sections in order. What re order do I read it in? Just the Sunday. Uh, section one, section two, section Be honest now. Because you, you unfold it. Yes. And then you stack it. Yes. And you take out the adverts and you stack it. Yes. What I want to know is your top three. Uh, magazine, business, and front section. Okay. Depending on what I'm seeing at each one. I'll, Love I'll circle back and forth through those. My wife is reading styles and the opinion section. Interesting. I'm Style Business Magazine, so I'm very similar. Pretty good. You. What about you? What are your top three? Uh, magazine, book review, and uh, probably style. You put that book review in there just to yeah. make us feel small. <laughs> I know that move. What an amazing <laughs> idea. I should be reading Put the book like review in there. <laughs> See, that's the thing is I don't read the book review. I feel very guilty about it, but I have so many books I need to catch up on. All right, when we get back from break, we're going to talk about what everybody's been talking about for two years, but the rest of the world um, started talking about last week, which is Theranos. And is this the Enron of this cycle when we get back from commercial break? And this is a very easy break for me to read. Envision app is brilliant. I use it every day. You can basically turn your web and mobile designs into clickable prototypes, which is what I do when I'm building stuff. And you can get feedback from clients and stakeholders in real time. And actually this year, what I did when I was launching this inside TLDR little tool that we made, my designer sent it to like 20 friends and family of the organization, just said, what do you think of this? Created a little Google Doc with a form. They gave us their raw feedback. Some of the feedback was inane. Some of it was brilliant. And if we didn't have Envision, we would have had to send them the final product, and then we wouldn't have had informed feedback 
from just consumers, you know, civilians as we call them in the business, um, before we did it. Just design is really important now in making products. It's the most important thing, and to a certain extent, as we are just talking about earlier, which is, hey, you have to get a product flawless and take out all the hurdles, and they do the best job of that. Everybody knows that. Twitter, Airbnb, Evernote, Adobe, and myself all using it every day, all day long. And right now, Envision is giving away their starter plan for free, 90 days. If you go to envisionapp.com slash twist, I love the product. I love the company. I'm not an investor. I wish I was. I'm an idiot for not investing. EnvisionApp.com slash twist. EnvisionApp.com slash twist. What a great company. All right, Theranos. This is a complete and utter uh, disaster right now. The Wall Street Journal, which does not um, publish investigative pieces lightly, and I think the person who um, actually wrote the story, I'm forgetting his name right now, um, has a Pulitzer under his belt. Um, They basically just broke the company down as a complete fraud, basically. Previous employees, obviously, are calling them out for their blood test not working and for them doing the blood tests on other people's equipment equipment while somewhat passing it off as their own. One in 240 tests seemed to work, and the Theranos team had a series of bizarre rebuttals on Twitter where they were basically calling into question the ethics of the journalist and showing um, John McCain giving the thumbs up on the technology. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, Quentin, you've heard probably rumors about this. It's obviously another publication. It's your peer in the Wall Street Journal. Hats off. No, fantastic work. I mean, Great I, journalism. I couldn't knock that for a moment. Like, yeah. That guy dug in for five months. Five. Five months, which is, you know, interesting because there was a lot of back and forth between investors and the tech world and saying to journalists, you gave these guys a free ride too long. Why wasn't anybody kicking the tires earlier? How did this take so long to happen? You know, how many places in modern media can afford to do a five-month takeout? That's interesting. You know, like, yeah, they, the guy's they, name is John Kerry Rue. Yeah. Kerry Rue. Do you know him? Uh, I do not know the you guy. You know of But, him, yeah. you know, it looked from the from first pass, it looks like very systemic work where he looks at a claim, he talks to a guy. Theranos, on their website today, has a big takedown, they say, of it. Uh, And at the end of it, say, he came in with an agenda. It was going to be a hit piece from the start. He found what he wanted. They gave no evidence of this, of course. Right. You know, so I would like to really know what they mean by that with some, you know. A lot of attacks, but not a lot of facts. And his piece had a lot of facts. You know what it reminds me of is the New York Times piece on Amazon, which had 500. I don't know if you worked on this, right? No, it was. There were 500. They talked to 500 people or something like that. Huge number. It was huge number. And now Amazon comes back, um, and they're using that PR guy. I forgot his name. Jay Carney, former press secretary for Obama. Obama. What is this new strategy that you're seeing to discredit the journalists? Well, I think it's. it does show that media power is, is weak and corporate power is way up. It shows that we are in a world where everybody has a, a <laughs> microphone or a keyboard and can broadcast. Sure. Medium.com, and in this case. Keyboards and you know, in, in corporations in particular can do a lot of messaging from a lot of points at once. Mm. And also that um, you know everything has a hook in it now, right? Everything's connected. So if I have a supply chain, you can look at it and tell if child labor was involved. And if uh, there's, you know, some food product, you can go way up and see if it was good for the environment. And journalism's going to get like that, too, where mm. you're going to check out all of my work and whatever right. you can find becomes published and subject to being gamed. Now, on one level, that's transparency. On the other level, that's another way to spin a story. We're going to have to see how that works out. But we're yeah. at the early days of a very different kind of journalism. It feels like there is something has changed in the last... I don't know, a year or two with uh, a lot of companies just, you know, counterattacking evidence or whatever. We had Elon Musk with the New York Times where the, um, I guess it was Randall Strauss, I think his piece maybe, can't remember, one of the pieces by the, the automotive group and they had the data was a little bit off in the story. The public editor came out and said, hey, in this case, Elon's right. The data was a little bit off, but we stand by these other parts. Right? Is this going to be the de rigueur now? Well, you know, it's interesting because you sort of scratched at this a little bit when you said the journal does not do these investigative pieces lightly. I mean, this is the kind of, this, the scale of this piece is something that the journal used to do, what, I don't, I don't know if it was every day, but every Monthly. Week. Oh, we can pay for, I was at the journal for 10 yeah. years, and we could pay for this stuff back then. 
It's, yeah. it's yeah. A, it costs it's a, a big lot ask to do this. now. Yeah. You have what four or five people on the story for four or five months. Yeah, and the guy's traveling, and you're off other things. You know, it's a the lot. The piece to... might cost if you had four or five people working on it. This could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, and by the way, they don't all make good. Sometimes uh-huh. you do this work for a couple of months, and it all checks out. So there's nothing really to write. Got it. You but if, if you ever look at the uh, statistics about the number of journalists versus the number of uh, basically. PR people. Oh my God, in, 100 to 1. Yeah, well, well, and that ratio has has tipped all the way over in the last like 10, 15 years. So I think that's a lot of what you're seeing is is it, it used to be, you know, that the journalists had the muscle and now the uh, the companies have the muscle just because they're in, employing five times as many uh, flax as there are hacks. I am about 98% certain that Theranos will not be here in a year or two. I, I think can. it's going to be a complete bust. I, I think my it's, spidey sense. It's it's early to say. Yeah. Um, either way, the story, just from a pure journalistic point, is at such an interesting narrative tension point because on Wednesday, the founder walked into a Wall Street Journal conference and just bit right back at them. Really? And called, oh, yeah. She called the them Wall a Street tabloid. Journal yeah, she yeah. went to a Wall Street Journal event and gave an interview defending herself. I mean, yeah. points for fearlessness... You know, she did not hide. And that was very interesting to watch real time. Hmm. She called the journal tabloid. She said the guy had an agenda. She had all these reasons, many of which did not check out so well when you... So very ad hominem, uh, like attacking them. There's quite a bit of that. And then she would refer to various studies she'd participated in. If you took it apart, the optics were a little funny. If I had been on stage interviewing her, I mean, she's the guest and it's a tense moment, but... The question for her really was, uh, so are you going to sue us? You that know? is the that is it. If you know, we what slandered you, you yeah. then by all means, Bring your stuff bankrupt us. And let's have discovery because yeah, that will sure. be really interesting. Go. You know, But see, that's, ex- but that's exactly – I would not necessarily assume – I wouldn't underestimate the amount of paranoia that she has and that that company has about their intellectual property. And, I, you know, I think that they would rather um, – They'd almost rather weather this bad news cycle than they would uh, let every, let the whole world in on what they're doing. Under you, normal circumstances, I'd go with that. This is a pre-IPO company. has been working 11 years. got a $9 billion supposed, you know, imputed value. They were on the track to go IPO. And she is making all of these public statements, all these various awards and ceremonies. And she was the public face of the company. What are the IPO chances any time in the next 18 months now? Never. No way. Zero. Zero. Well, we'll see. 0.0. Zero. Zero. Yeah, I, I can answer that question. Okay, you're tough. Here it is. The board of directors. George Schultz, former U.S. Secretary of State. Gary Rughead, retired U.S. Navy Admiral. William Perry, U.S. Secretary of Defense. Sam Nunn, former U.S. Senator. Can I get US a doctor? Marine General Course, <laughs> CEO of Wells Fargo, U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, U.S. Senator, former director of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, chairman of the board, uh, chairman of the and, and uh, two people from inside of Theranos. The thing that I've heard over and over again um, is that they only have one person with any medical degree or professional. That's William Forg, who is the director of Centers for Disease Control. And is this Bill First on there, the senator? Yeah, he is. He used too, to be a doctor. Uh, so one yes. and a half. Heart He's not lung a practice. Yeah. Doctor doesn't really mean anything in this context. When well, you, I mean, it means you're knowledgeable, but not about blood testing. If he asked for the reports, which I doubt, he could have read them. He, the other, right. he the other guys are like basically meatballs. He couldn't vet, certainly you know, couldn't vet the technology. Concerned. This is what I heard. I've been hearing for two years that a lot of people who wanted to invest in the company, serious people, um, and this is going to be a little bit of hearsay because this is like secondhand and this is like what I hear at, you know, conferences or whatever, but I travel in circles where people invest money, is that you could look at the documents around the financials for the company, but nobody who wanted to invest was allowed to look at the technology. I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard this more than one time at cocktail parties. Oh, well, I guess you didn't know on Tuesday, Bill Maris, the head of Google Ventures, who is also a physician. Or, I did hear this. Yeah, said... We looked at it. We passed. On Wednesday, she denied that. She said they contacted us. Maris is standing by what he said. Yeah, and this is the thing. This guy Maris is very – I love this guy. He is so blunt. 
when the guys from Secret shut the company down and cashed out and all this stuff, he called it like highway robbery, like fraud and everything. He then backed off the statements a little bit when he talked to the founders, but he's a blunt guy. He's candid. So this is now, he is basically saying he couldn't get his head around the tech because they wouldn't let him do the due diligence. I heard that from multiple people. If you are not letting people look at the do, do the due diligence and look at it, the great companies, and I've invested in some of them, when you come meet with them and they're like, they have the goods, they're like, let me show you the goods. This is an NDA. Let me show you the goods. Come into a document room. I'm not going to give you the documents to take back to your office or to, in digital format, but by the way, here's the sales, right? And so that to me was a smoking gun. When I heard this, that you couldn't do due diligence and you're being expected to put tens of millions of dollars in, game over. I, I, I believe that, but I wonder if it... If, if maybe um, we're applying the wrong analogy, that just biotech biotech moves so slowly, the amounts mm -hmm. of capital involved are so gigantic that you know maybe a higher degree of paranoia is just. I mean, you know, in, in software, you always hear, you know, it's not it's not whoever had the idea first. It's not, you know, but in biotech, you're you're really talking about. Um, a long, long window in which if, if somebody else catches wind of what you're doing for, you know, for, for some really huge companies to catch up to you. Well, that's just super groovy, but you don't then come out and say, I am changing the face of medicine. I can do 240 tests. It's just a drop of blood. You keep it humble, right? Well, I mean, they did for, for 11 years. They didn't tell anyone what they were doing for what, 11 years, nine years, something like that. Forbes declared her a billionaire. Was it two or three years ago now? She was happy to pose for a cover, talk about it. She's been on the public stage many times. I think this is having it both ways. All right. Uh, one of the former Google people, um, I'm sorry, Apple people, what's his name? Um, the French guy. He actually did Gasset. the- Gasset. Jean-Louis Gasset. Yeah. Jean-Louis Gasset. Yeah. Um, he had a really uh, breathtaking thing where he basically tried the technology. It didn't work. And he did like a bunch of, he did side-by-side -side tests. Um, what is your theory of what went down here? I know you're journalists, you deal with facts. But what would if if it is uh, the person did not go into this thinking, nobody would go into this thinking, I'm gonna create a huge fraud here. If we all agree she probably that the technology, the majority of chances the technology just didn't work out. Is this a case of a founder you think that got in over their heads? Like in other words, the lie got kind of big and then they started covering up the lie? or that they sincerely believe that they could have gotten there, maybe if they were given enough time, because the co-founder committed suicide. And nobody seems to want to talk about this fact either, but his wife said that he said the technology didn't work. Now, if the co-founder commits suicide and the wife says it doesn't work, to me, I don't know why more people are not talking about this. Maybe it's uncouth to talk about the well, suicide. Well, this was another one of these kind of creepy moments during the journal interview, because she said, you know, how sort of unseemly it was to bring the widow into this of a man who had committed suicide. Oh, and by the way, she was a plaintiff in a lawsuit. <laughs> you know, I was like, then he... Well, then he, they threatened, she, she threat, they, the company threatened to sue the, the, the widow. You know, look, we, none of us know the story. It is somewhat improper to speculate. That said, <laughs> <laughs> here we go. That said, speculate who's, away. <laughs> who's, the pri who's the primary VC in this? Tim Draper. One of the most boundless optimist believers sure. the Valley has ever of produced. Course. I think Tim's the kind of guy who sees something and believes. And he's held in there for over a decade. Yep. And if that is your theme, you know, companies have very consistent histories over time. They develop personalities and they play out that way. And she's dropped out of school on a mission. This story assembles in a very particular way of world-beating hope that plays to a lot of the tropes of the valley. Right. We're going to overcome. But this Nobody is, understands us. Right. And we're going to break through this. You know, the, the incumbents need to get out of the way. We're going to break the rule. You know, it plays to all those things and becomes a very Does attractive being a story female for the journalists play as well. into this, do you think, in some Who way? Where's black turtlenecks a la Steve Jobs? A little bit? A little bit, right? Like, I mean, she's on the cover of every... This is the thing that I think is going to be she really... She is fearless. Weird. It's fantastic. I. It's fantastic or it is... Absolutely, I don't know if the word psychotic, but it is no fantastic in both senses could be the word. It, this could be fantastic in that if this turns out to be complete fraud and she sat for cover photos saying claiming she's the next Steve Jobs, what would this say about the person? It this doesn't. Be, it, it doesn't. It's work. a Madoff like. It doesn't work like that. You know, so many founders. Yeah. It's like 
it doesn't matter that it's not true yet. I'm going to make it true. And frequently, the delusion. not frequently, but you know, they break through and they do it, right? Yeah, pe delusional we, people change the world. Yeah, biological stuff is a lot tougher than the electronic stuff, though. This yes. is not software. This is no. wet stuff, and it's really different and hard. Yeah. I, so, so I think that um, in some ways, the question of whether their whether their tech works or not is a distraction from another question, which is more interesting, which is, you know, what if it what if it does work? I mean, you know, we saw what happened with Twenty Three and, and Me this week. They're very comparable companies in a lot of ways, and they're both um, approaching this premise. They're, they're both uh, pursuing this premise that uh, consumers need to have complete access to their health data, right? And that's a pretty like that's a controversial. It's radical. That, it's something that deserves to be questioned. It deserves to be a, a question. Sure. That assumption. Except one gives the data and one doesn't. Well, <laughs> yes. But, um, you know, the, so... Same so, vertical, same concept. Disrupting healthcare by empowering the consumer. Yes. And, Agreed. you know, that's that's not something that... Um, I, I, so 23andMe, the, the way that they had their breakthrough this week where they were able to start, start you know, delivering health-related reports now, yeah. again, is basically they had to work very closely with the FDA to um, to convince the FDA that, that the consumers would understand the tests that they were getting. Um, you know, this... I, I, I guess um, you know the idea that, that consumers who uh, that the consumerization of healthcare is necessarily a good thing. There's a lot of reasons to believe uh, that it, that you know it's not good from a public health standpoint. It's obviously from an uh, from an individual right standpoint. We all want to think yeah. that we have we have the right to have as much information as we can. But there's a lot of evidence that uh, the more you put healthcare decisions in the hands of consumers and take them away from from professionals, you know, the worse public health outcomes we're going to have. This is a um this is the seriousness of it. And I think, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jean-Louis uh, Gasset, which is uh, mondaynote.com, if you want to read it. He went and he did the test. And after two failed attempts, I'm quoting now, to establish the Theranos account, I gained access to my numbers, platelets 430, which given his condition is high, uh, hematocrit 44.1, a passing grade, but uncomfortably close to the 45% limits. And then Stanford hematology disagrees, platelets 320, no concerns, come back in two or three months. Hematocritic 41.1, ditto. The differences are disquieting. Theranos' numbers are an alarming 34% and 7% higher, respectively, with Stanford's, whom should I believe? Curious and a bit troubled, they got Theranos to retest, and a day later, Theranos... 370, a drop of 13% in 24 hours. Hematocrit, 40.6, 8 point, I'm sorry for butchering those uh, words, um, minus 8.6%, now I'm well into the safe zone. And then, uh, yeah, so the Theranos numbers have two problems. They and I believe inside the journal story, they found in one case a potassium level you'd have to be a dead guy to achieve. So reliability consistency may be an issue here. Then he went and he emailed Miss Holmes, a brief word, I'm a 71-year-old male, blah, 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 engineering, I once ran Apple's engineering Cupertino, uh, gave her all the facts, I'm curious to hear more, you can guess what happened next, he says, nothing, no response, I shrugged off and went to other topics, but the question nagged at me, there are no stated aim, inexpensive, painless blood test is admirable and I hope achievable, um, and, uh, I believe this is going to turn into, this is my gut reaction. This is not fact. I'm not covering it. I think this is going to be Bernie Madoff, Enron level fraud. That's my belief. For a company that wanted to be public, putting it in Wall Street terms, it now has a difficult story. A difficult story. Well said. All right. When we get back, YouTube Red and uh, a couple of other things we're going to talk about, their paid thing. And let me just thank our friends at Pager Dewey, Duty because being on call is brutal for development teams. You get constant alerts. And if you roll your own monitoring systems, you're going to waste hours and hours and hours doing that. Pager Duty aggregates all of your monitoring tools, uh, monitoring tools in one place, which then makes it really reliable. And it gives you clear visibility and accounting. 
uh, into who's responsible uh, for fixing certain things and if these are alerts that you need to wake people up and take them out of their kid's soccer game, which is the reason why developers and sysops people, DevOps, they leave companies if the pager duty is not handled correctly and pager duty makes sure it's handled correctly with iOS and Android apps that let you be on the go. A hundred plus pre-built integrations. We talked about integrations, how important they are before when you have a platform and PagerDuty has escaped velocity on that. I know because we use it as does HipChat, eHarmony, Pinterest, New Relic, Airbnb, Nagio, Slack. Hey, there they are, Path. Everybody uses it. And one of my uh, great, great um, portfolio companies, Chartbeat, which is doing really well, by the way, um, they say PagerDuty gives Chartbeat one central place to send critical alerts, and they now have a simple solution for processing on-call scheduling. So here is your call to action, everybody. Sign up today and get a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twist, pagerduty.com slash twist. Hey, and you get a free t-shirt with your first alert, pagerduty.com slash twist. And if you love the show and independent media like This Week in Startups, go ahead and thank at pagerduty. Good product. I use it. And you guys know how we do the advertising here. It's whitelisted. If I use the product, they can advertise. If not, if I don't use the product, they can just buy an ad. It's pretty innovative, right? All right, now you guys are cringing. You're like, oh my God, is the New York Times going to have to do native advertising like this? <laughs> this is the future for you. You'll be reading. I think that's a present for you. <laughs> is it? NASCAR is just exactly. on my coat. It, you, you guys do native advertising yet? We do native advertising. But it's a different group. They never would come down to you or Markov no, they don't and be assign. like, hey, no, John Markov, would no, you like to? They do not assign. They do not assign to you. No. There's other writers in the building who are separate, independent marketers. And, you know, at first I didn't have much problem with native advertising because we used to have these inserts, you know, visit beautiful Bulgaria in the newspaper. Yeah, like little magazines. Right? It's advertorial. Yeah. And What's you'd old have special new? sections in Forbes, same kind of thing. And it seems a lot like that, but it's getting the layout, the design, the way they roll into them. It's very hard to tell it's an ad. That's and the thing I object to. It does make people uncomfortable. If, if you, you look at a, well, it was very interesting. You remember a couple of weeks ago when um, ad blocker showed up in the new version of the iPhone? Of course. And we, Crystal, did, these, we yeah. did these stories about loading and Boston.com had a terrible load speed mm -hmm. when there was an ad. You guys a, sold Boston.com. They had this pre-roll, yeah. yeah. And, and they had this pre-roll. Yeah. And, you know, this huge video download you had to take. And I noticed that BuzzFeed had almost no difference if you used ad blocker. Of course. Not. That's because <laughs> all the ads why. were native ads. You know, it was it was that they were stories. It, yes. You, you, there were no ads to strip because the ads were inside the content. The FTC is not pleased about this. They sent a warning to Google about the native... Um, looking ads at the top because you put just a little, they moved the little ad button over. Last year, the FTC sent this warning to them and a bunch of other people like, hey, could be a little bit clearer. And nobody's followed up on this story that I know of. I think this is a hot lead for somebody to talk to the FTC right now because nobody even knows that Google got this letter. It was very lightly covered. And the FTC for sure is going to come down on this native advertising on Google and BuzzFeed because if you look at the top level, you can't tell. And it turns out somebody did a study online last year, 40% of people who looked at Google results did not know they clicked on an ad, 40%. This is a huge, huge uh, wrecking ball that's going to come to Google and everybody else when the FTC decides finally to act on it, if the FTC has any teeth under Obama to ever take an action against Google, which apparently they do not. Well, so you think, you think the American people, nay, the world population, is somehow going to become media literate and media savvy? Well, I mean, I th that's a great question. I mean, I'm interested in what you, you think. You kind of have to be these days, but... Because the government is not going to take any enforcement. In Europe, they will. In the United States, clearly, they won't. So then it's left up to Jeff, I guess, the consumer now, yeah, to figure it out? I don't, I don't see who the constituency is for, for uh, going after publishers who are using native advertising. I mean, it's... You know, you, you would think normally it'd be the journalists who'd be the one saying, let's let's keep the church state wall in place. But in this case, these like these, you know, the buzzfeeds of the world are, are the, the employers of last resort for it's uh, an ad studio as much as it's a journalism outfit. And they're clear about that. It's an ad studio. And oh, I see what. So this is where the whole like uh, three days of the condor comes in here. The journalists, if they want to stay employed at certain publications, they can't do an investigative piece about the FTC not taking any action against the native advertising. So there's no teeth. Why would I go? I mean, the journalists would have to then kill well, their own publication. And it's, it's a very so, unpopular it's, thing it's to do. It circles back to Jay Carney going on Medium and publishing on behalf of yeah. Amazon. There are just a lot of powerful players right now. 
Or it's like, remember I was saying the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. is one of the few institutions that can afford to do investigative. Yeah. Frankly, our industry, we're very lucky people in it, but it's been decimated. Yeah. And the returns aren't what they used to be. So to have these expectations that we're going to continue business as usual are heroic at best, right? How, how, about, how about Josh Terangel, the editor of Business Week, going to Vice, one of the big uh, native advertising players yeah. this week? I mean, that's... It is crazy, yeah. I had actually, it's very interesting. Vice they asked want me. The, they want the values of traditional media, but they don't, they've killed the business model of traditional media. Right. It's, Both things cannot be true. This is the thing. Chairing that. Maybe can, they can be at my institution, but I'm in the lucky few. You're in the lucky few. Right. You guys can hold on. You more guys likely, are the top of the food chain. More likely is a scenario you saw uh, on a website called The All a couple yeah. weeks ago where they wrote about the Chicago Tribune. Where people now sit in the newsroom and on the web, you know, visit some town 50 or 100 miles away, look at all the yoga studios and write top 10 yoga studios in Grand Forks <gasps> oh, or something. Brutal. And that gets printed in the local website. Soul crushing. It's a little tough. It's a little soul crushing. It's, it's not what it used to be. I'm third generation in this business, and I don't think my kids will be in it. You know, it's really interesting. When I was in New York and I no, was No, they, they will be in it, but it'll be a very different business. I'll put it I, that way. I think we're the last generation, because when I was in New York, we fought about this. And when, if anybody in the advertising group at Silicon Valley Reporter, I put them on the other side of the building, and I said, you are not allowed to go talk to my writers. And if they came over and talked to the writers, and I saw it, immediately would chase the ad salespeople out of the group, because I knew what they were doing. They were either but trying Jason, to... they were married. Joke. <laughs> Here's the thing. I just basically said to people, if anybody's advertising, their chances of being covered in Silicon Valley Reporter just went down. Yeah. And that... When was this? This was in the 90s. Exactly. Different world. And now it's over. It's over. And then you look at Gawker, it's like, I can't tell what on BuzzFeed... I, I'm in the business. I, I click on links sometimes and I'm like, what is this? What? This, this feels wrong. Like oh, mine, it's, an, it's an ad. Outfits like mine are going for subscription revenues and part of that has to do with authority. Right. Like we sell authority. Right. I don't, you know, maybe you sell, you sell authority inside your space, right? You're, you're a deferred, you know, people go to you and it's trustworthy inside that. But that can't be shared out by that many outlets. You know, Inc. is it for small business. New York Times and the Wall Street Journal... The Guardian. I mean, we're starting to get looking we're, for competitors globally at this point. Yeah, we're down to like on two hands. Yeah. It's down to two hands. Well, and then you look at the media. Or 5,000 blogs, whichever way you want to look at it. 60 Minutes, Frontline. Who else is doing investigative pieces that are matter in video? I don't know. Right? The real tragedy is probably going to be in, in, in the form of problems with government. It's going to be in like city corruption and county corruption right. and low-level state corruption because no nobody's going to cover the school board anymore. Right. You know, we'll still put people in Washington. Yeah. We'll cover that stuff. The Pentagon's still going to yeah. have somebody listening for a whistleblower. But that kind of low-level, I'll scratch your back, small town stuff, it's going to be very hard corruption to Corruption will surfaced. go up if the press is no power. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to cover the media business, and a couple of years ago, there was all this talk about uh, that nonprofits were going to pick up the uh, yeah pick up the slack. You know, Texas, what was it, Texas Tribune, and the um, uh, I don't hear anyone talking about that anymore. They do for you know, um, ProPublica does Pro Publica, some big sure. lifts, which are great. But yeah, again, they've had some good high, ones. They go for high level stuff. It's but but also like, the idea was they go for the New York Publica Times stuff. Yeah, is that they were gonna they were gonna prove the concept, and then that was gonna bring all this that's private a, money yeah. in that would uh, that yeah. would you know replicate that the model kind of everywhere, like and that's not happening. Substandard sure. cement being used in the school construction. It's gonna be very hard to surface that if you don't have a small local journalism. I had you know I had Vice this week asked me to sit for an interview about startups, and I was like. Um, can you guys look at this story and my comment on it? Because I emailed you about it last year where they did a post where they said I was a racist or something because of my white privilege and da da da. And I was like, you spell my name three times wrong. You said I was a billionaire. I'm not close. Uh, and you never called me about the story. And here's the other seven things that are wrong in the story that you never fixed, including spelling my name wrong twice. So you wrote an attack piece on me that was not fact-checked. You never called me. You called me a racist. And you never responded when I complained. Forgive me, I'm not going to sit for an interview with you. And I know that you said in the email to me that you're huge fans and blah, 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 blah. 
And I, I CC'd Shane, and he never got back to me. And I've been in the magazine when they were in Canada or whatever, 10 years ago. I've known him. I know everybody over there. It's like the, the level of journalism, the time to fact check, to check people's spelling of their names is gone. Shane was probably interviewing Obama at that moment, so. Which is the craziness of it. Everybody's like, oh my God, vice, vice, vice. You know what? If you can't spell people's names correct in the Vice News site and you hire idiot journalists with no experience who are not even journalists or content creators, then what am I supposed to think? This is a message for the team at Vice. <laughs> Your reputation is being ruined because you don't do basic journalism. And if you guys can't spell my name correctly, get all these facts wrong, then what am I supposed to think about the goddamn videos you're making? How many lies and half-truths and unchecked facts are in the stuff you're putting on HBO and your other partners? God damn it, I'm upset. He's an angry man. I'm so, I, you know what? It just, I'm disappointed. I, I really did love Vice for a while. And then I was like, oh, Vice wants to interview me. Fine. Then I remembered, oh my God, I'm an idiot. These people didn't spell my name right and call me a racist and got a 10 other facts wrong. Well, Vice is doing the, uh, I, I, is it uh, Jonah Peretti who coined the term, you know, the mullet strategy? Oh, yes, I do know. Let's explain it to for, you. For, for the, uh, I think at the Huffington Post, he coined this, uh, this, this uh, idea that like your front page is very edited and curated and professionally done, and then you Go have wild. all these other pages that link off it that are just kind of a bunch of user-generated, like, crappy clickbait. Yeah. And uh, Vice is basically doing that with the HBO show, which actually is, I mean... Well done? It's pretty, it's pretty good. I'm not is sure it, it deserves quite all the praise it gets, but when I've watched it, okay. it's been, you know, it's not I 60 wonder minutes, if, but... I wonder if they're playing fast and loose with facts there, too. This is the thing about the you know about the journal. They've worked out a system and the New York of getting Times, you know, that people makes you feel... into remote areas and doing yeah. up close stuff. I thought mm -hmm. they did fantastic work in uh, the Crimea where they mm -hmm. covered the vote and they had people going into the Tartar regions and you know no one was being allowed to vote mm -hmm. inside it and the, the cameras were right there. That was pretty impressive stuff. They're fearless. Stuff. Yeah. They're fearless. Yeah, and they like going to weird places. I just places. wonder if. You know, they're making stuff up like they did in the story about me. We're not checking into facts. All right. <laughs> uh, okay, Meet Red, the subscription YouTube. Uh, obviously, YouTube this week is forcing everybody, if you want to be part of uh, YouTube, you have to also be part of the subscription YouTube Red um, with original program. They're going to charge like 10 bucks a month. You won't have any ads. And if you do not sign in a very, very heavy-handed move, as platforms are wont to be, they will remove the videos of creators who don't sign from the entire platform. Pretty heavy-handed. Uh, and uh, what do you guys think? Golly, you it was going to be like Woodstock, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Turns out it's about money. Mm. Dang. That's it. All right. There you have it, folks. <laughs> what Big do you companies think? do bad things. I don't. I mean, I think that uh, I think they can do this kind of thing because it, it it seems like every six months you hear about somebody somebody or other is going to be you know the YouTube killer. They're going to get all the creators over. wasn't Wasn't that uh, Yahoo's plan for a while? They were going to lose. Yahoo all the... lost forty million dollars doing that community. cockamamie community. They lost forty million. What a disaster! Well, that was just the stupidest thing in the first place because everybody it was it was such a it was such a bad idea because they were like oh well netflix does it and amazon does it so we're going to do it and we're like well you don't we'll have a subscription business right so they, they basically applied the the cost that somebody with a subscription business at scale has yeah to an advertising business mistake number one number two they picked a show that nobody else would pick up i love community but did you watch it on Yahoo? I, in fact, I did watch it on Yahoo. Now, they also did an episode that had ads in it. The whole episode was based around the Honda Camry or something or a Toyota. Did you see that one? Yes. Was it horrible? It was, was, it... It was that very, like, winky product placement where it was like, let's, let's you know, joke about the fact that this is product placement. But, I mean, 30 Rock did that. You know, that's, that's been the— uh... Austin Powers did it yeah. back in the day. So they did an entire episode around a Honda or some car— and they still couldn't make it profitable. Yes. Is Marissa going to even be there next year? The whole thing seems to be coming apart at the seams. What do you think? She won't be there next year. Remember that thing I said about the market cap? Yeah. Google alone went up between 1 and 2 p.m. more than the value of Yahoo. Yeah. It seems like there yeah, is... Google tried to sell itself to Yahoo way back when, right? I know. Like in, the, early, like, in the dawn of all this. It's crazy. That's the, yeah. me the message to any founder, or young founder, should be just never sell your company to anybody because you could wind up being a thousand times bigger than them. The, things, the fortunes change so much. They didn't get mobile right. She was supposed to get that right. They didn't get social right. 
They missed the boat on that. Right. Personal publishing, they were going to try to do with Tumblr. They ha- that hasn't worked out. And mobile was supposed to be the other thing. So it was supposed to be like their mavens, their mavens. mobile, video, whatever. Nothing has worked. And then the cyclical trend of the web and display advertising is absolutely crushing them. Apparently now their their hope is that uh, Tumblr is going to become an enterprise CMS. You're kidding. That's... No. That is the most farcical idea ever. Yes. No, you're joking. Uh, I, this is what I this is what I was told yesterday. Yes, an enterprise CMS. An enterprise CMS. What is yes. that? Which, which is was, was always David Karp's dream. To be fair, of course, David yeah. always wanted to be working for Shell Oil and BP Oil to build to publish their publishing system. No. Are you being facetious? Or no, I'm not being facetious. I, he did I, actually I want to do enterprise. No, I was no, I was being facetious about you that. Part. I'm not facetious about the part that that uh, that. Uh, I, so I was told yesterday. But uh, here's the thing: the world's going to learn with Marissa, I think, is that her time at Google was correlation, not causation. There was a huge success while she was there. She may not have had anything to do with it because she doesn't know product. That's clear. She's not a product person. I mean, everybody's saying she's a product person. What product did she create? She never created any product. The second thing is she was supposed to be this great culture person. The people who worked for her hated her. And they, she made them wait in line outside her office. Jason Shellen was on this very program and said, he, she made me sit outside her office for two hours and wait for her in office hours. People at the time hated working for her. And people I know. There was a great piece. How did uh, she get the job? There was a great piece about, uh, in the information about Yahoo this week. And one, one of the things that really jumped out at me was um, that the attrition rate is way up. I think they're at the, they have the uh, like all-time highest attrition rate. And if you remember, when she started at Yahoo, one of the things, before, before she had any kind of you know, met success metrics whatsoever that she could point to in earnings calls, she was talking about how many resumes they were getting, all the, all the boomerang hires. Yes. That was, boomerang hires are up 66% or something. You know, it was all about what a great place, how many people want to be working Culture. at Yahoo. And it's, okay, so if that's your bar that you're setting for yourself, you know, you let's talk about the What attrition. were you going to say you heard, though, also with the enterprise stuff? What'd oh, I'm just wondering. So I think when uh, I think when they acquired Yahoo, it was Tumblr. Uh, sorry, when Tumblr, when Yahoo acquired Tumblr, that it was a that he had a four year um, deal, a four year deal, right? A big deal, which, hundreds of millions. Is that next year, next May, that that will be? Uh, it's that probably be up. It's got to be three years. She's going to be there for I think next summer or something. Mm. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, I like Marissa socially or whatever, but I mean, just looking at it, you know, this you have the cyclical trends against Yahoo. You have picking four strategies, not one. Huge mistake. The fact is she doesn't seem to be like a very great communicative leader. Like all the people who were her like inner circle are leaving. And then there's a fourth thing, which I don't think people anticipated, which is if she's not good at product and they didn't set a good product strategy and she's not particularly a great people person and a leader of people, if you're up against Square, Twitter, Facebook, Google, Uber, you know, pick the company that's crushing it as competitors. And these people are offering huge stock packages. Well, people are not idiots. They're, you know, if you're an elite person and you have 17 other companies that are more elite and on the upswing, where are people going to spend many their years, time? How many years ago was it Steve Jobs went down there and just basically said, you have to decide if you're a tech company or a media company. And it mm-hmm. almost doesn't matter which one you choose. Just choose one and be yes. that thing. Yes. And for all the different changes in leadership, that's been something of the dilemma. I mean, if, if you look at uh, what Tim Armstrong did at, at AOL, you know, I mean, I was I was at AOL when he came there, and it, it definitely didn't feel great to be a journalist at what was becoming an ad tech company. Yeah. But he he, he picked, did exactly he that. Chose, he picked. He picked. And, chose decisively. Everybody made money, and everybody feels good about it. Yeah. And you know what? I give him credit because when he went there, it was like a content company. I had sold Weblogs Inc. there, Huffington Post, TechCrunch, a bunch of people that sold their content. And he said, I'm going to EdTech. And you know what? Smart move for him because he's not a content guy. Yeah. He's not a content guy. He's a sales guy. It took him a, I think it took him a year or two. I do think he wanted to make it a content company. I know. And, it, and then and he some, realized. Some pains, oh. but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't even keep the blogs I gave them that were successful running. They literally were like the, the unofficial Apple Weblog, Twa. Cinematical, TV Squad, all these things were doing great. Joystick, they're like, yeah, but we can't manage multiple brands. I'm like, that's what media is. Viacom is a collection of brands. Time Warner, Disney, collections of brands. If you can't manage more than one brand, you can't be a content company. 
There's no, there's very few companies in media that are like one singular brand. I mean, Vice is right now, but ESPN became part of Disney, Pixar, LucasArts, Marvel, part of Disney, Viacom owns MTV and blah, 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 blah. You have to be able to manage multiple editorial groups. Condé Nast, you put people on different floors, you let them have different cultures, you're good. Mm. Common infrastructure. I think the Valley has trouble with these kind of things because the Valley likes things that automate. Mm. And media doesn't automate all that well. No. And these journalists and these content creators, God, they want to talk to people. They want to be given packages. <laughs> they have attitudes. <laughs> they don't listen. They don't yeah. sit in their box and they don't, you know, they, they're aspirational. There are programs that write sports stories and God. weather stories and house stories and all those data stories people like. And they will start generating slideshows too as AI gets better. It's so interesting you bring but this up. That's low value stuff. I thought Marissa was onto something really good when she was buying all these mobile companies for small amounts of money. And I was like, oh, she's going to give weather to this mobile company. She'll give Yahoo Mail to this one. So, or she'll give Yahoo Finance or Yahoo Sports or any of these things that have huge scale. You give a mobile organization that and you incentivize them properly, holy cow, they could do really well. They'll get you in the top, whatever, 20 in the app store for the vertical. You, from there, you're on third base. You just got to steal home. Easy. Then I saw she bought Sumly. I passed on investing in Sumly because I read the summaries that were the algorithm supposedly made, the AI, the machine learning. And when I looked at it, I told the guy who was the founder of it, it's like an you know, 18, 19 year old kid. I was like, let's read out loud the summaries. And I read out loud the summaries. And I was like, this is bad. It doesn't summarize the story. The most three most important things in this story are this, this, and this. He's like, no, 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 that, that's a pretty good summary of it. I was like, no, that's a terrible summary. A human being could summarize this better. I'm an editor. I edited 70 journalists at the peak. I know like this is bad. Then I found out that he bought the summarization technology from like somebody in Oxford and that had a design firm do it. And then she put him in charge of news. And I was like, you're parading around this 19-year-old kid on like Good Morning America to run the news business. Really? So far, you can't automate taste. Yeah. You know? Judgment. Yeah. Opinion. We'll see. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes. I actually don't think it will happen. AI's in our got a long way to go. Huge way to go. Yeah. All right. Coming around home right now, um, passive aggressive Airbnb ads. I don't know if you guys saw this. You saw it, Jeff. I saw one. Explain I, this so to the people listening. It's basically uh, Airbnb's ad campaign, which which uh, which they're running in in advance of this uh, this big vote that will determine how strictly the city of San Francisco limits uh, Prop F. Prop F, right? Thank you. Um, so. Airbnb is running this this ad campaign, basically asking for the city's gratitude, saying we we uh, we injected twelve million dollars. I know our host injected twelve million dollars worth of hotel taxes into the city's coffers this year. You're welcome, San Francisco, and it's it's all like we're you know we're helping keep the libraries open longer. You're welcome. You know, isn't it park <laughs> nice? You're, you love Airbnb. The bike lanes was and, the other one. Right. Libraries right. open longer. Bike lanes being maintained, and I think parks or something. Yeah, and they really weren't thinking this one through too well because, to the extent they've hollowed out hotel taxes, this isn't a really convincing argument. Problem one. Problem two is that it, it, uh, somebody did the math uh, uh, to see how far their their money would actually go in keeping libraries open longer, and it was like one minute a day they could keep libraries longer. Oh, so the whole budget for the hours, yeah, would be equal one minute yeah. a day. And then problem three is it was only 18 months ago, and nobody has forgotten it was only 18 months ago that they were still fighting having to pay that hotel tax in the first place. So right. it's like it's like it's like having to chase down your deadbeat boss to give you a paycheck, and then he turns around the second he hands it to you and says, I pay your salary. <laughs> yeah, now, I like the Google bus. I like the Facebook bus. I don't want to see a lot more cars on the street. I think it's a really good idea. But you know what I, what I mean when I say this has that Google bus vibe. You know, it's kind of like Tone Silicon death. Valley Tone interlopers death. coming up to our fair city and doing their damn tech thing and then expecting us to say thank you. That's going to be the effect on a lot of ordinary people in San Francisco. The ads were gone in a day. It's really interesting because, listen, I'm new to the city. And Internet I'm a New shame at scale. It was amazing. What's that? Internet shame at scale. The ads were down in a day. Absolutely. I was absolutely on my guard. I'm kind of hated in San Francisco as well. They'll definitely be protesting at some point when I become mayor. But I did my bit. You did your bit. <laughs> but actually, you know what? It was interesting with your piece. And by the way, I had no problem with your piece at the all. The listeners I know should a... know I wrote a piece about the tenderloin and quoted Dana. Jason, uh, yeah. Jason, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> yes. Jason. I jumped out of a car. And jumped Tesla. out of a car and... Saying the truth, which is it's dangerous. Yes. I, I wasn't misquoted. I had no problem with it. Um, here's the thing. 
I believe, I'm a New Yorker. I watched our city in New York go from being a complete S show under Dinkins, who's the worst mayor in history, uh, Koch, who was a really nice guy who was closeted and was against any type of funding or helping people with gay men with AIDS. It was a real shame, and he was quite incompetent. We had an incompetent city for a long time. And then we had Giuliani and Bloomberg, and you had these two very competent mayors who got a lot of stuff done. Now, there were some things about Giuliani that were a little bit too much. Bloomberg, some people disagreed. I come to this town, and I see a lot of what I saw in the 70s and 80s, which is a permissiveness about things that are dangerous. I also see that we lost a lot of the flavor of Manhattan because Giuliani cut down on too much. He drove a lot of the artists out. He drove a lot of the things that made New York, New York unique. So there's a balancing that has to go here. Like he shut down the clubs as an example. Like Peter Gation couldn't operate. And it was like, well, you're going to get rid of the nightlife. It's kind of why people are here, right? Like it's okay for the palladium to have people getting high in it or a little bit of drugs and a little bit of dancing. I don't care. But what's happening here is they've, it's bizarre to me that the Tenderloin has to have every single homeless person in the same area. I read Season of the Witch, great book. I understand the history of the SROs. But they're allowing methamphetamines and crack cocaine to be dealt and taken openly in this area. There's only 7,000 homeless people. And the amount of money they have and they're spending on this, they could easily house the 7,000 people. So I think that the people who run this city are incompetent. Am I wrong? Am I an elitist? What, what's, how, what do you think, Quinn? You wrote the story. Um... Am I wrong that we should just take care of this problem and give everybody housing first? And that it's unacceptable to allow people to have methamphetamine and crack on the street openly? The Tenderloin has a number of problems in terms of getting cleaned up. Mm -hmm. One, it is one of the last affordable places. These SROs are... A thousand a month. Yeah, relatively cheap and yeah. they're regulated. And immigrants come and live here too. You see the visible underside right. side of the Tenderloin and it's awful, but... It's got the heaviest immigrant population. It's got the highest population of children. Like poor people live here six to a room too. They're oh. just kind of hiding out from the street. The Oof. Tenderloin on a street level. I can't imagine I walked that. around for a month and the feeling I had more than anything is it's really a kind of open air madhouse. And people are self-medicating and they kind of know where the walls are because they don't drift into the rich neighborhoods nearby. Nope, they're contained. And they're largely schizophrenic or otherwise addled. And they're self-medicating and they kind of don't want to go into institutions or can't get into institutions. Yeah. And that's really part of the core problem here. Yeah. But the institutions that w are willing to take care of them on almost an outpatient basis, if you will, they're located here too. Right. And they can't get relocated. I and think slowly it will change, but there are really some deep reasons why it's having Yeah, all the methadone changing. clinics here, all the you yeah. know food clinics, all the people doing the hard work the, are here, the, too. The, the, the sad things about the Tenderloin are very visible right at the front. There's a lot of hardworking, good people in these places, too. Yeah. I feel bad And they need kids. the housing. Yeah, The kids tough. is heartbreaking because I walk down these streets. I don't feel safe. I can't imagine a five-year-old yeah. walking down these streets or a 10-year-old what The street life seeing. is all kinds of crazy, and... Even while I was there in the summer, there was this weird sort of drug war going on because in other neighborhoods that have come up like the Mission, the dealers are getting scared off or they put the extra cops on the market and there's going to be off. So there's a war for corners. Yeah. Like the, the, um, the supply demand imbalance in corners is really tough. It's a and limited so, like, number of places. guys are getting knifed, you know? Yeah. And the, it, I, I looked at the studies. One of the interesting things is the city is great at studying the homeless problem. They can't solve it. Yeah. They can't solve this suffering. Uh, and you're right. In this in this report, I think it was a third were suffering from serious mental. Two-thirds were self-medicating, uh, abusing drugs or alcohol or self-medicating, however you want to say it. Um, and uh, you put it all together. Probably two-thirds are doing some combination of mentally ill depressed, out of work, and taking drugs. Now, the police will tell you they do not tolerate drug sales. But the fact remains, there are people from Walnut Creek driving in here, scoring a little crack to have a wild time on the weekend, and then going back to their white-collar jobs. For sure. You know, and that's a big part of the sales as well, is that out of, it's out open of district air. sales. I talked to the cops. They told me, not a New York Times reporter, that they're not allowed to arrest people, and that even in the city now, they're not doing petty crime thefts anymore, yeah. breaking and entering, because they know they're just going to get a ticket because they softened all those laws around minimum sentences. So you have a very liberal city, a very permissive city, a very artistic city that wants people to be able to pursue their muse, walk down the street naked, 
whatever, you know, was very open to the gay community, obviously, which is obviously the correct thing to do. But this permissiveness that I perceive in San Francisco is so open and permissive that this little last 10% of it is like, yeah, but I take drugs and I smoke weed and I get drunk on the weekends. And yeah, maybe I do a little coke. Therefore, like if they're doing a little bit of drugs, that's cool too. But what they, people don't realize is it's methamphetamine and crack, which are a totally different thing than doing those other categories of drugs. Well, the the, the laudable thing here, I mean, the, the, so the, the picture that you laid out of New York, and I, just, I moved here last year from New York, so yeah. I experienced a lot of what you're talking about. But Shocking, right? I, I think that the, you know, the, the San Franciscan argument would be, well, a, New York accomplished a lot of that by sweeping its problem under the rug, by displacing it from the city center yeah. and sending it out to the outer boroughs. Yep. And, you know, San Francisco hasn't done that and wouldn't do that. I mean, there would be actually a civic outcry. I think if they were going to literally start busing homeless people to a place where they were less visible in San Francisco, I think that, you know, the city would react. Well, I think that's exactly actually, what will happen the, in you go, out of the, yeah, you go out of the far end of the Pittsburgh Bay Point line on BART, you'll find quite a few of them are, have moved out there and are moving out there. Yeah, Giuliani basically made, like, there was like three, he had three or four choices in New York. Number one was you could be in a shelter. Uh, number two, you could be in jail. <laughs> number three, you can get a bus and get out and go to a different town with that my understanding was, and somebody will fact check me on this, I'm sure, one of the fans, but that the city of New York paid other places to take on the homeless and would give them a payment and give them a bus ticket and say, hey, can we send five homeless people to your shelter? We'll pay for it and we'll give you a little spiff, basically, to those little towns that would do it. But I do think there's something, and I would love to hear from people who are experts on this, and I've got enough information to make myself dangerous, but the the housing first movement is going to cost less than the emergency room visits and the drug rehab, but you just can't put everybody who's suffering and trying to get a better life in the same place. And that's where this town is at, like a little bit of a standstill, is that the hippie, you know, indigenous San Franciscans who have been here for a long time and listen, it's their town and we're interlopers, right? Those New Yorkers coming here. Um, you know, they have a bit of a point, like we've done it a certain way here, but I think what's going to happen is I think the anarchists and the hippies are going to lose in the next five to 10 years because real estate trumps everything and money trumps everything in my experience. And this is prime real estate. And these buildings could go for a lot of money and these apartments could go for a lot. And what will happen is once you start converting, and there's a lot of conversion going on that you saw of the storefronts, mm -hmm. if they start converting and I'm paying taxes, I got a lot of money and I start calling the police and I got friends in high places, I'm going to get my block sweeped just like it's happening in the mission. Well, by the way, the hippies displaced somebody. San Francisco yeah. was a blue-collar labor town. That's right. And all after, Irish. after World War II, I mean, all these guys shipped out of here, and they thought, man, this is beautiful. You know, If I survive the Pacific, I am living here and not in Kansas. This is nice. Yeah. And they got blue-collar jobs. And they got a little bit displaced by the beatniks and big-time displaced by the hippies. And then the lawyers, and it became the capital of gay America because it was live and let live. And that yeah, the, became a higher income. The gay people, people pushed have out been a lot getting of people pushed, too. Yeah. People have been getting pushed out of San Francisco for quite a long time. Yeah. That's in the nature of it because it's got such a small geography. All right. Let's uh, wrap up with this. It's another media-related one. I love having journalists on the program. It's a tough shot. But um, Facebook is uh, sped up. It's not in the documents, but they, they uh, are speeding up this, hey, put your uh, post on Facebook. We're going to share revenue at some point, and it'll all be faster. Medium at the same time, full disclosure, I have a tiny investment in Medium, very de minimis. Um, they are encouraging people to publish to their platform. They'll be splitting revenue. And in fact, I believe the New York Times responded on Medium to um, some of the claims um, yes. in the story. So they're actually doing some responses there and losing some page views. Um, and uh, Twitter is doing moments at the same time. Where and they're I think an instant articles product of their own too. And that's the Facebook's. rumor. What is your take, Jeff, on all of this in terms of being a publisher today? And yes, you're going to be on other platforms, so you get reach, but people are not going to come to your site. Is this a wise thing for publishers to do? Is it a trap? It's a trap. I, yeah. I is think it a trap? I, I think it's the best. Uh, I, I, I think it's it's often the best of bad choices. I mean, it's better mm. to it's better to get 50 percent of a of an ad that Facebook sells for you than you know, 100% of the ad you can't sell yourself on your own site because right. nobody has native traffic anymore, <clears throat> except, for, <laughs> except for the New York Times. We have some place. native traffic. You guys have a lot of paid subscribers right now. It's We're 30%. over a million. We're and over a million. Is it 30 or 40% of the revenue yeah, now? Yeah, and the goal is to make that primary. 
But you win those guys, and you mm. win those guys by showing up in a story they like that they saw on Facebook, maybe. Yeah. You know, and you, you, so you surface to them. Journalism's like a three-legged stool. You really have three things you can sell. One is immediacy, and nobody ever wins that all the time. So that's mm. a tough one. But you get, you know, these wire CNN, services. Yeah. Well, AP. Reuters and AP was yeah. what I was thinking about, but various specialty wires. It's hard to do. Bloomberg. You know, they, they work hard at People that. trading on that information. We get it some, there. but it's usually a big scoop. It's not the incremental stuff that makes the bread and butter for that. Then there's authority. Is this true? Boston bombing hits. We get a lot of traffic because they know we're only going to publish the stuff that's true. Right. Whereas other guys might be moving a little too quick. And then there's analysis and contextualization. Where does this fit in the world? Yeah. And we can sell that pretty well. Yeah. And those are all good. I mean, two of those three are excellent subscriber businesses. Yeah. So we it's have clear. Some, your guys will get there. And I but love, it does mean that we have to keep the brand very, very distinct and pure in those areas. You can't have a Jason Blair. Again, <laughs> I wish you wouldn't bring that up. But yeah. Well, whatever. I mean, stuff listen, like that is very corrosive to the brand. You know, the way I look no at question. at Jason Blair is like I look at it as somebody at some point is going to go off the rails in every organization, and if you own it. The way the New York Times owned it and unraveled it all made me respect the New York Times a hundred times It was a more. monster takeout. It was, but you know what? And then you look at Stephen Glass and the Republic, everybody can have this happen to them. And I think they had to judge an organization. It was the New Republic that he was working at, I think, but he had worked at multiple publications. Um, when you look at Stephen Glass or Jason Blair, it's how the organization responds to it and how thorough they are in cleaning up the mess. And that's how you would judge them, right? Hopefully. I think that's how people have judged. That's how history has judged it. I, going back to the platform issue, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's as big a deal. I don't think it's as new a thing for publishers as mm. it's kind of being made out to be right now. I mean, you know, publishers have always distributed their physical copies to to newsstands, and they give a cut of it to wholesalers, and they give a cut mm. of it to retailers. So I don't see how how it's any different distributing their article on Facebook and giving a cut of you know what it sells for there to mm. to Facebook. Well, what's the ink play? Because this is an interesting time to be a journalist with a reputation. You actually examine the business model when you take the job, right? Right. Like, you know, so why why do you do that? Explain. Because time was. It was just a print newspaper, and it had a ton of money, and the margins were twice the average for an American company. I'll be okay here. Now you're sort of like, now the way they're thinking about how they're going to make money, do I think that's going to be true in five years? And hmm. you sort of, you check it out. Yeah, what are they going to put going in? on that was compelling to you? Uh, I thought I thought it was compelling that it has a, a very uh, well-defined audience that has a that it has a really strong relationship with. You know, it's better to have, better to be, Deep and you know, deep and narrow than it is broad and shallow. Yeah, um, I thought that uh, they were getting a, an increasingly big part of their revenue from the events business, which I think we've all looked at. I mean, when I was at Forbes, that was the same part of their strategy. I think everybody's looked at, um, you know, what well and the Times. I mean, you guys. It's are, one are of the great paradoxes well of the Times that in this digital age, human moments become the valuable. Yeah, thing. has he has the event Wall business Street become Journal. very meaningful for the New York Times on a revenue basis or just on an influence basis? On revenue, it's okay, but you know, we, we don't knock any revenue source. But it's less than 10%. I couldn't tell you yeah, precisely. Yeah. It's low it's, single digits. It's not a barn burner yet, Yeah. but it is very important for us, absolutely. Yeah. You guys have a space there, too, for And also the that kind the of, yeah. that relationship business. Have you seen this Times Insider stuff, Yeah. which is available to subscribers? You know, mm -hmm. you can get the backstory. You can take this apart. You can do mm -hmm. that sort of tagged thing I was telling you about where, where we expose the journalism a little yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. So... God, you yeah. guys did an interactive thing in the last couple of weeks that I tweeted and I really loved. Oh, you know what it was? I just figured it out. Um, this was incredible. You did the um, number of people donating, the big donors to the big uh, oh, presidential yeah. campaigns. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you scrolled up and it was an interactive of something, like a pile of money or something. And it just had the people on the top. And then you could look at the map of where they all lived. It's a tremendously great interactive mm -hmm. piece. What goes into a piece like that? Well, our designers, we've hired a ton of designers, a ton mm -hmm. of software people, and they work very closely with us. That's an area now, like, you know, I have a story I like, I'm working well, and the first question to me is get the video people involved. How can you yes. get the design people involved? Yeah. How can we put some hooks into other parts of this and communicate this you have story a guy named in Eric more ways? Eric works there, who's really good. Um, I love all of us. Yeah, it's really good at it. The video stuff's been tremendous, too. Thank you. Well, you know what the great... I mean, obviously, I'm a subscriber, but one of the great things is I think that that, hey, you love the story, you've been back, it's your sixth one this month, it's your seventh one this month, that innovation, which I don't know if the Times came up, I think it's some smaller publications might have done that first, but like you have a 
it expires at a certain point. You get 10 for free and then you have to get encouraged and people can run around the, the poorest paywall as it were. That seems to be so effective because I forget to log in. I get seven or eight and I'm like, oh, I got to get my login on this new device. Um, uh, okay, listen, we could be here all day, but this has been amazing. Uh, thanks so much, Quentin Hardy and thanks, Jeff. Um, everybody can follow them, uh, Q Hardy and Jeff Berkovici. Bervo. Berkovici. Berkovici. I'm going to spell it B E R C O V I C I. Jeff Berkovici. Close enough. At Inc. Quentin Hardy. Go ahead and subscribe to the New York Times if you don't, especially if you're a millennial. Let me just make a This is the message to millennials. I look in the camera for these, Quentin. Yes. This is a message. For millennials, you're in business, you want to be taken seriously. There's like five publications, 10 publications you should subscribe to and read and pay because they're part of your personal development. Inc. and New York Times are two of those, The Economist, Fast Company. There's a small number of publications. Be an adult, pay for a subscription, and read those, not people reblogging them. And understand who the journalists are who are, the journalists are, the journalists are who are doing primary research. Get to know them. Follow them on Twitter, interact with them, because if your company is going to be successful at some point, they're going to cover it, and you want to be able to know that you've read them and their byline and know who's actually doing the real journalism in the world. How's Besides, that for a plug? The shit's fantastic. The shit's Just great. Just read it. Read it. You know, it's, it's like good. really amazing stuff. Go every day. to the source. Read this stuff. You know what? It's like a lot of these kids. They're like listening to like Donovan or the Monkeys. No offense, and they they don't know who Dylan is. It's like go find out the primary. Go find out. Go listen to the Dylan, the person who's actually. I don't understand what he meant by that. I just, basically, <laughs> there's a source. This stuff came from somewhere, and there's a source that did the primary research. The business insiders reblogging it or having to post reblogging it, but they didn't pick up the goddamn phone to do any stories. They know the times. They're they're living in their parents' basements. They, they start, <laughs> they're getting it upstairs. Be nice. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Pager Duty, for subscribe for an, an Envision app. Thank you, Pager Duty and Envision app for supporting independent media like this week in startups. And thank you to my team for working so hard on the event last week. Ashley Bryce, John, Jake, Kevin, Jackie, Luke, Matt, everybody, and the team at Insight. Congratulations on a big watch this week. And hey, let me just take a moment to thank John Young for working really hard for me on the launch ticker and then going on to his next adventure in Hong Kong, going to learn to be a developer. He did a great job working for me. Okay, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.